Just by a show of hands, how many of you are grateful for negative people in your life? Anybody grateful for like whiners and complainers? Anybody grateful for the people who can find something wrong and negative with absolutely everything in life? Anyone? No hands are up. You know, it's funny that no hands are up because there was a movie that was produced in the 90s that was so popular that it got a sequel. And it was about two men who never had anything positive to say, who always criticized other people, who were negative, and they were not just negative, they were grumpy at everyone and everything in your life. Do y'all know what movie I'm talking about, the movie series? Grumpy old men and grumpier old men. Do we have any of you in here? You know what I'm talking about, grumpy old men? Ed, come on, raise your hand. We all see you. We all know. We know. And it's funny because we really enjoyed these movies, obviously, because there's two of them. And the thing that we enjoyed is that it wasn't happening in real life, and we could make fun at how ridiculous it was for people to always be negative. Well, in Jesus' life, he found himself always surrounded by a group of people who were negative. No matter what good he did, they would criticize it. No matter the amount of love or kindness or grace or hospitality or just general goodness he showed to others, other people around him would just nitpick and criticize and find what was wrong with him. They were the religious leaders of the day, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin. They would see everything Jesus did and they would find something wrong with it because he was a threat to them. He was a threat to their way of life, to their influence, to their approach to life and everything else. And that's what we're going to be talking about today in Mark chapter 3 as we look at verses 1 through 6. Jesus was going about his life, and at this time he had kind of become a big deal. People knew his name, people wanted to be around him, and as he would go from place to place, a crowd would kind of follow him like Tiger Woods at the Masters. There would just be a group of people, no matter where he was, where he was going, what he was doing, that would just want to be in his presence. Today we're going to be looking at him as he is on the Sabbath going to the synagogue. Just like many of us today on Sunday are going to church on the Sabbath, Jesus was walking into a temple to a place of worship. And this is where we pick up the passage. It says, and he entered the synagogue, right, going to church on a Sunday. And a man was there with a withered hand. So in the temple, you've got a guy whose hand did not work right. He was deformed. He had a, a handicap in his hand. And they watched Jesus. The, the they is talking about the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the people who knew and commanded and taught the law, the people of influence in the synagogue. And it was so bad at this point, talking about negative people in Jesus' life, these grumpy old men, that they had people who would constantly follow Jesus, just looking at him, spying on him to see what they could do and report to the religious leaders. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, that is the man with the withered hand, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, come here. And he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. And he, Jesus, looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched, out, stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him. How to destroy him. Now there is an amazing picture that is taking place that if we pay attention to the details of this story, we can see. You got to keep in mind, Jesus is famous, right? Jesus is popular. People wanted to be in his presence. So it's not like you and I, whenever we go to church, we go and hopefully our greeters, our first impressions teams open the door for us and they say hi. When Jesus went into a place, there was a crowd. People were surrounding him. And I'm amazed by the attention to detail of Jesus in the story on how he was paying attention to the needs and the people of those around him. Because as he is surrounded by others, he is able to notice a man who is outcast, a man who is off by himself, a man with no social status, a man who was deformed and treated like a handicapped person, a man who was isolated from the crowd. As he walks in, he notices a man with a withered hand. Now, I'm just curious. When is the last time you walked into a room 
and you saw and noticed the man with the withered hand, the man who was isolated, the man all by himself. That's what Jesus does in a crowd. And in his mind, he is going there to learn and to worship. He wasn't there to minister to a man with a withered hand. It was a Sabbath day. He was there to worship, to sing, and to hear the ministry of God's word proclaimed, right? Or to proclaim it himself. But he notices this man. Jesus sees a need. And I think it's so powerful for us to see the example of Jesus because as he is seeing a need, the spies, these religious people, see an opportunity to accuse Jesus of doing something wrong. You see, it was the Sabbath day. And the Sabbath day was one of the most sacred rules that the Pharisees and the religious leaders held to in their day. It comes from Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. It's one of the Ten Commandments. And it says this in in Exodus 20. It says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all of your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Now keep in the context of Exodus chapter 20. This was the people of God who had just been delivered from slavery in Egypt. And to them, they never got a Sabbath. They were slaves seven days a week, 24-7. They worked when they were told to work. They worked when they were tired and didn't have anything else to give. They continued to work. And so God, in his providential goodness, gave to his people a day of rest. Now, I want you to know, I love the Sabbath day. Like, I love my Sabbath. Don't mess with my Sunday afternoon nap. Are you with me on this? Like, I love my Sunday afternoon nap. But what the religious people had done is they had taken something which was a gift, the Sabbath, and they had turned it into a burden. What religious people did back then is what religious people do today. They had a commandment which was meant as a gift, and on top of this gift that God gave his people to rest, they put rule on top of rule on top of rule on top of rule. To the point to where this gift God gave his people to rest became a burden for the people. For instance, the religious people had set up these parameters, these rules, to where you were only allowed to travel or walk so far. When it came to meals, you were only allowed to to prepare only certain meals. Think about it this way. Many of you might go home and have a Sunday afternoon lunch. Maybe you're going to slave in the kitchen, right? Maybe make that that meatloaf or pork chops or fried chicken. Invite me over. I'd love to eat any of that stuff, right? You got the fried potatoes. You got to have the whole meal and all the fixings. That would not be allowed because any person in the kitchen who knows, see how I didn't say any woman in the kitchen, but any person in the kitchen knows to prepare that kind of meal is hard work. Can I get an amen from the cooks? What you would be allowed to do in that kind of situation was go get your leftovers from the the weekend and heat them up because that's not really working in the kitchen. When it came to water, you would be allowed to to maybe get a glass or a cup of water for you, but when it came to the idea of getting a bucket full of water to where you had to work to move that bucket from one place to another, not allowed. Rule on top of rule on top of rule on top of rule. That's what religious people do. And that's what these Pharisees had done. They had oppressed the people with all these rules and regulations. And so when Jesus walks into the temple and he sees the man with the withered hand as he is surrounded by all these people, he gives us this lesson. That no matter where we are, no matter what we're doing, no matter what's going on, no matter what other people's expectations are around us, we must have eyes to see the hurting. He sees this man isolated, outcast. He sees this man in the temple, dejected and discarded by society. He couldn't work. He couldn't earn a living. In a day and age where everybody used their hands, he had a withered hand, a hand that didn't work. And Jesus sees him. And he gives us this lesson in here that we must always have eyes for the hurting. There's a certain organization that everybody loves, a company that everybody likes to go eat at, not just because they have good food, but because they have the greatest service of any restaurant chain you can go to. The name of this place is Chick-fil-A, right? Y'all know it. 
You walk into this place and you feel important. And the reason you feel important is because every employee has extensive training on the customer experience. You can go online, you can Google this, you can look on YouTube, you can find Chick-fil-A customer service training. They have four principles they have for dealing with every single individual who walks into their store. Number one, you are to look at their body language. They want you to be able to read whether or not they are downcast, if their disposition is bad, if they look sad or happy. They want you to pay attention to the needs because they don't know if you're coming in and you're coming from a funeral or maybe you just lost your job or your car broke down or if you're frustrated or if you're having a great day. They want you to pay attention. The second thing they want to do whenever someone's talking to you is they train their employees. Whenever they're talking, you lean in. You give them your physical body language saying, I am interested in what you're saying. They don't want you to just listen to them. They want you to give eye contact to each one of their people. And what they say is they want every single one of their customers to get the full attention of each one of their employees. In other words, when you're talking to a Chick-fil-A employee, their job is to make you feel like you're the only person in the restaurant. You know what that does for the people who go in there? It makes them want to come back. Now, you can have your argument on Popeye chicken sandwich or Chick-fil-A chicken sandwich, but I'm going to tell you this. First of all, cleanliness, there is no competition, but when it comes to customer service, Chick-fil-A teaches what nobody else does, that every person matters. They are a Christian-based company, right? Based on Chris Christian principles. They want to make money, but they are teaching the church what we should do with everyone who comes in. We should treat everyone the way that Jesus treated the man with the withered hand, to notice them, to pay attention, and to show the love of God, because I can tell you this, every single person that comes into our church deserves to feel the love of God. They were made by God in his image for his glory and for his purposes. And Jesus sees this, right? And he can sense what's going on, not just with the man with the withered hand, but with the Pharisees and the religious leaders. And so in verse 3, he calls out to the man with the withered hand and he says, come to me. And where some people might avoid conflict, where some people might avoid this trap that the Pharisees were trying to set for Jesus to break the law of the Sabbath, Jesus invites this man to stand next to him. He brings this man who wants to be in the shadows to the forefront of everyone's attention. This controversial moment that the religious leaders had set up, Jesus says, come here, and he brings him next to him. Can you imagine being this man? And then Jesus, with this man with a withered hand next to him, said to them, that is to the religious leaders, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm? To save life or to kill? But they were silent. See, Jesus saw an opportunity in this moment when evil and these religious leaders saw a rule. They were so concerned with the Sabbath so that they could bring an accusation on Jesus. But Jesus brings this man, and he asks a simple question. Is it lawful to do good or to do harm? See, the scripture tells us that if we know what is right and we do it not to us, it is considered sin. Jesus had the power and the wherewithal to heal this man. And he, he could do it right then. He, he just asked a question. Is it, is it lawful to do good or to do harm? Should I help this man or should I just ignore him, act like he doesn't exist? Is it lawful for me to, to save this man's life who has no livelihood or to kill him? And what's so interesting about these questions that he's asking, with this man with a withered hand next to him in the temple, is all of a sudden he has painted the religious leaders into a corner. They have nowhere to go. Either they will be filled with compassion or legalism. Either they will be filled with a heart of kindness and care or animosity and hatred. Where they meant to trap him, Jesus turns the table on him and says, what am I supposed to do? And they were so bewildered by the situation. They were so stuck in this situation that they can't even respond. They can't look at Jesus and say, it's the Sabbath, do nothing. Speechless. 
And Jesus is teaching the religious leaders. And he's teaching you and me that we are to always have a heart for the hurting. I think about this in, in, in our church. I think about this in our communities, in our schools, in our place of work. There are hurting people around us all the time. There are people who are going through depression, whether it's a life of depression or seasonal depression. There are people who are going through loss of jobs and tough finances, family situation, marital situation, rebellious kids, school issues, work issues, hurting people. And Jesus, who had a heart for the hurting, wants us as his followers to have a heart for the hurting. Jesus wasn't worried about rules and regulations. He wasn't worried about the burden of the law. He was worried about being freed up to love people in the name of God. To live out the word, not be restricted by it. And he didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And we see this in his life and his sacrifice. That he who knew no sin became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God. He was there to help those who needed it the most. And he still is there. To help those who are hurting. And the glory of his greatness. Is he calls you. And me. Despite our flaws. And our past. And our hang ups. To be his hands and feet. And to minister to others as well. And as we see this. Not only is he there to, to heal the, the hearts of these people. He creates a situation that I think shows the greatness of his love. Look at this as we continue in verse 5. It says, and he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. Very interesting. Jesus saw these religious leaders. Their job was not to stand above everyone and condone them for all of their sinfulness. It was their job to explain and to display, to model God's word. It was their job to teach the word of God, to pray for their people and to lead them into godliness and holiness. But instead they took their authority and they lorded it over people. They took their authority and they oppressed people with the word of God. The most ironic thing about this situation, they wanted to accuse Jesus of working on the Sabbath. They themselves, who were spying on Jesus, looking to trap him, they were the ones working. Jesus was there to worship. And he sees their behavior and their actions and their disposition. And the scripture says that Jesus was angry. This is Jesus' divine justice in the moment. But he didn't just stay angry. He didn't yell at them and chew them up one side and down the other. The scripture says not only was he angry, but he was grieved at their hardness of heart. His heartbreak for the evil of their people. His heartbreak at their hardness of heart. His heartbreak for their animosity towards him, the Son of God, was checked with grief. I think he shows the heart of the Father in this moment as clearly as anything else. How many of y'all have ever heard the words, this is going to hurt me a whole lot worse than it's going to hurt you? Come on, raise your hand. I remember when my dad said that to me, I looked at him and I said, well, give me the paddle. I got a beating that day. You know, the paddle, discipline, correction, is meant to correct. By the way, I don't know if you can tell or not, this paddle has a stand. I need this whole thing in my life right now. Put it up on the mantle for my kids to see. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. 
But there's, there's this thing that, that Jesus gives us. When we're frustrated with people, whenever we see sin, whether it's in our house or in our friendships, in our relationships, it's, it's okay to be angry. But we should feel grief with our anger. When we look at our world, what's going on in the, in the news and society, there's a lack of justice, and a lack of justice should stir up frustration, but not just for anger's sake. Not so that we can be mad and curse the darkness, but it should stir within us a, a grief that we are so far gone as a, as a country, as a, a people, their division, the strife and animosity. I mean, honestly, whenever we think about it, it's easy whenever we think about our kids, like we shouldn't discipline our kids out of anger, but when's the last time you got in a fight with your spouse where you had conflict at work or school or in your neighborhood and married with your anger was grief over the situation? When's the last time in a relationship when things were going south, your first thought was, man, this breaks my heart that we are here. And I think Jesus is using this moment to try and bring the religious people back to himself. Saying, guys, think about it. Think about this Sabbath day. Think, well, what are, what are we supposed to be doing here? Are, are we to be kind or are we to be evil? Are we to, to give life or are we to, to kill and take it away? And you can, you can see the, the tension in the room. And the heartbreak at Jesus with this man with a withered hand next to him. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out. And his hand was restored. And the Pharisees went out immediately, held counsel with the Herodians, who they hated, against Jesus on how to destroy Jesus. They were so concerned about themselves that the ability to do any good was removed from them. They were so concerned with their way of thinking that they never thought about how they could minister. They were so concerned with themselves that they never looked beyond themselves to see the need that God had called them to be light in a dark world in the same way that God calls us to be light in a dark world. Jesus did not die on the cross for our sins so that we could hold banners and, and rallies and, and fight with our neighbors. He came and died so that we could have life and share his life with others. He gave this withered man this man with a withered hand, hope and newness of life. And in the same way he gave hope, we must have hope for the hurting. We have it in our back pocket. We have it in our hearts and our lives. Those of us who have received Christ Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior, who have said, God, I know that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior, we have everlasting hope, and God wants us to share his everlasting hope with others. And I'll never understand how or why God would use somebody like me to be a messenger of hope, but I sure am glad he is. He wants us to bring healing to a world that is broken. He wants us to have eyes that can see, hearts that are broken, hearts that are moved by compassion and love. He wants to partner with us to share his goodness and glory with the world around us. And the way that it starts is by humbling ourselves. We need to humble our hearts. We need to place ourselves below other people to share and to serve and to give the goodness of God to those around us. He wants us to be humble, that we would think more of others than we would our position or what they might even think about us. He wants us to be humble. And as he saw the man with the withered hand, he wants us to see the needs of the world around us. He wants us to embrace other people's needs. 
That's why we're collecting food for those who are going to be hungry on Thanksgiving. That's why we are collecting Christmas gifts for boys and girls who parents, they may not even have parents whose families don't have enough resources for them to have Christmas morning. It's why we're doing Operation Christmas Child. We want to embrace other needs and leverage that into an opportunity to care and to serve those around us. And there's this great thing that God gives us. He gives us not just a heart for others, but he will give us eyes to see the needs if we ask him. If we say, God, I know there's people in my life that are hurting. I need your help to see them. God will answer that prayer. He will be faithful and just to give you eyes to see the hurting. It could be while you're driving down the road, you all of a sudden have somebody's name come to mind and you think, you know what, I need to call or text that person. You might see a person that your kid or your grandkid goes to school with and you can tell that they wear the same shoes and the same outfit every day, every other day. Maybe God is calling you to to bless that family in the name of Jesus. Maybe you're walking in the grocery store and you can tell that somebody just trying to get enough. Maybe God impresses on you to buy their groceries and not just to share his kindness but to share the gospel message with those around you. Ask for eyes to see, and I promise you, your eyes will be open to be used by God. If we're going to bring healing to the world around us, we have got to love God and love others. We have to love God so much that our love for Him compels us to love other people in His name. We have to love God so much that that Holy Spirit controls us and moves us from where we are to where God wants us to be, to do what we, not what we want to do, but to do what God is calling us to do. Controlled by the Spirit, not controlled by fear, not controlled by the flesh, but to be controlled by the Spirit who is living and active, moving and working within us. Not grumpy Christians. Not a group of people who points out the flaws of everything else in the world. Who looks at what's going on in or outside of our church and finds something to be negative about. He wants us to be filled with gratitude for the healing he has done in our own hearts and lives so that we can share his love with others. The question for you is, will you love like Jesus loves? As you think about that thought, maybe the first thought you have is, do you even fully know Jesus' love? Have you ever come to a point in your heart and your life where you've asked Jesus to save you from your sin and to cleanse you from all righteousness? Have you ever asked him to save you? Have you called upon his name? If not, there is no better day than today to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and to experience salvation. Maybe you're in here and your first thought is to think of how maybe you have animosity with someone else. Maybe instead of being controlled by love, you're just controlled by anger. Anger without heartbreak. Maybe there's someone that you need to apologize to or something that you just need to give to God and say, Lord, I want to be controlled by love, not anger. Maybe what God is calling you to do this morning is to walk forward and join your heart with God's church here at First Baptist Rowlett and become a member of our family. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask our praise team to make their way forward. And as they do, I just want to give you an opportunity to ask God, Lord, what do you want me to do in this moment? If that means today is your day of salvation, in just a few moments we want you to walk the aisle. If that means you need to pray with someone, our ministers are going to be down front, you can have someone to pray with. If that means coming to the altar, you come to the altar and you respond to God however he's leading you. Pray with me, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today and we are grateful that we can call you Father and know that you hear us and love us. We're grateful for salvation, the forgiveness of sin, how you move and work in our hearts and our lives and how in anger you're grieved 
and for the example you give us in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that you move in our hearts today, that you transform our hearts and our lives for your glory and our good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.